Do you know how the orcs first came into being? They were elves once. Taken by the dark powers. Tortured and mutilated. Now. Perfected my fighting uruk -hai. I hope you're sitting comfortably because I have something of a massive tier list for you today. I am going to go through all of the traits, both positive and negative, that affect biological empires, be they regular or hive-minded. First, I'm going to go through all of the positive traits from my F tier all the way up to the best of the best, the S tier. And then when I've done that, I'm going to talk about the negative traits. Now, the first thing I need to point out here is, is I need to point out an answer to a question. And that question is, why should I add negative traits to my population, to my pops? Why should I make them worse? Well, when you give them negative traits, you get extra trait points, which you can put towards having more positive traits. So if you give yourself some negative traits that aren't really very harmful to your species, that means you can have even more positive stuff and overall have a fantastic species which has so many upsides and manageable downsides. And this is of course before you get into having genetic engineering and unlocking more trait points as the game goes on. So it's very powerful and very important to remember before we get started. We should also briefly talk about what the rules are for traits. So at the start of the game you'll get two trait points. You'll be able to purchase a total of five traits, although non-standard traits, that is traits which have a cost of zero, are not counted towards that limit. That can be things like Necrophage or Lithoid, and for that reason I've actually not included those traits in this tier list today. So let's open up and start with the worst of the traits we can get. This is the F tier, things that I would say actually hinder your population overall rather than helping them. And I'm going to come out the gate swinging here by placing conformists right down in the bottom here. So this is a trait that costs two points. Uh, just to talk about the key, you've got the left hand side is the number of points that that trait costs or refunds in the case of a negative trait. And then also I've got a, an up arrow or a down arrow in red and green saying if it's going to become worse or become better over time. Conformist is something that stays bad and uh, starts bad and stays bad for as long as it is in existence. What does it do? Well, it increases the governing ethics attraction by plus 30% of your population. Many people uh, have managed to play Stellaris without even opening the factions tab, without even noticing it. Yes, okay, maybe there's going to be a faction rework in the future, but for now it does have very little impact. The overall change to your influence generation and happiness of the pops in your civilization by changing the governing ethics attraction by plus 30% is very, very minimal. And on top of that, this costs two points, meaning if you select this trait and no negative trait, that's all your species can afford, which is diabolical. For that reason, it's going straight into F. Docile has the same problem as Conformist, it costs a whopping two trait points, and what does it give us for that? Minus 10% from Empire Sprawl from Population. At the start of the game, the Empire Sprawl you're going to be getting from Population is basically negligible. As the game continues, you will have more and more population, and the Empire Sprawl from those pups will go up, but as of 3.2, and for a large number of patches before this one, we can completely offset Empire Sprawl with bureaucrats and we don't have to worry about it. This means that Empire Sprawl is really not an issue, you do not want to be spending trait points on this, however yes, it will get better as a trait as the game progresses. Venerable, we get plus 80 years to our leader lifespan at the cost of four trait points. That's double the cost of anything we've seen so far, and it's double the cost of the initial number of points you even start with. So in order to take this trait, you would have to take some negative traits to balance out the points expenditure. But what does it really give us? Well, leader lifespan plus 80 years, at the start of the game, that means that our leaders, which if we're a regular biological empire, are going to be living for around 30 to 40 years from the beginning, well, now they're going to live for an additional 80 on average, meaning they've got a base lifespan of around 120 years uh, into the game from the very start. Now, why is this rubbish? Well, first off, there is the cost that I mentioned before, but also 
There are technologies, there are traditions, there are events, there are a myriad of ways to gain extra leader lifespan once the game begins. There are even, there's even an ascension perk so you can, as you become cybernetic, you're going to get slapped with a big plus 40 year leader lifespan as a trait that is added to your pops. Meaning if you're going down that route, and you'll probably get that somewhere in the first 30 to 50 years of the game, as long as you've picked up one of the technologies and possibly the tradition, you can keep extending your leader's lifespan ad infinitum, well, at least uh, until a point that becomes irrelevant from a gameplay perspective. So getting this bonus here actually becomes pretty useless. And the longer the game goes on, the more options you have to completely do away with leader lifespan issues or kick it into the long grass. There's a repeatable that gives you plus five years. If your technology level gets to a high enough level, you can pick that up in a year or two and keep doing that every few years pushing that leader lifespan back and back and back, giving you functional immortality. So from my point of view, this is crap. And relegated to the tiers of roleplay. Resilient gives your defense armies plus 50% damage. Now, there are one or two specific builds where this could be very useful in some sort of multiplayer situation where you're trying to build some sort of zombie horde where and, and defend your planets to the last man, that kind of thing with fortress worlds upon fortress worlds, fine. In that case, it can be strong. But in all other cases, resilient is the waste of a trade here. Plus 50% defense army damage is very, very pointless to have in a game so heavily focused on economics and space combat. Talented increases your leader level cap by plus one. This only costs one point. On the surface this seems fine. Why have I put it down here in the F tier? Well, for the same reason as Venerable, there are many ways of increasing your leader level cap as the game goes on. At the start of the game you have a leader level cap of five and it can be pushed up to a maximum of ten. There are so many traditions and civics that push up your leader level cap that by taking it as a trait, you are going to get to that maximum of 10 earlier, but entirely needlessly early, and then it becomes superfluous. Because you are going to be taking these traditions, you're probably going to be taking these civics because some of them are absolutely fantastic, so it's really not going to help getting plus one cap just a little bit earlier making this trait basically a waste of points and it takes up a valuable trait slot of the five maximum we have available to us. Radiotrophic replaces half of the food upkeep with energy, no energy upkeep on Tomb World, and then you get a Tomb World habitability bonus of 10% and Tomb World pot growth speed bonus of 10%. Why is it in the F tier? Well, Tomb Worlds are notoriously difficult to find. I have done a playthrough as Fanatic Purifiers, a tree people, and I went around trying to create Tomb Worlds. It's both tiring and needlessly complicated. It is really a trait that is, it's much worse uh, because of the fact it's double the cost of phototrophic. And usually it has the same effect as phototrophic, which is something I'll cover later, but that is the replaces half of your food upkeep with energy. On top of that, it's really important to note that we actually don't want to replace food upkeep with energy. Food is a resource that is actually easier produ to produce, generally speaking, than energy. If you are a biological species, your base food production is probably going to be a bit higher and you're probably going to find more ways to generate food. So it really doesn't make sense for us to pay in order to change up our food upkeep for energy upkeep, which is a damn sight more important than food. And if you're enjoying this video, please genetically engineer that like button. Now I'm going to look at the positive traits for the C tier. What's in C? Well, the first thing we've got here is Agrarian. Agrarian costs two points and it increases the food output of our pops by 15%. Now, generally speaking, unless you're running some sort of food specific build with catalytic processors, you really don't want to have any pops working farmer jobs. You can produce food in a myriad of different ways and you can get a better uh, income efficiency by not actually having those pops working farmer jobs, get them to work something else, get them to become scientists or metallurgists or simply anything of more value to our civilization. On top of that, it's going to cost us two whole points, and that's why I'm placing it down here in the C tier. It would be higher for a build that does require food production, 
but I'm looking at the general builds we have, and generally most builds don't need that. Conservationist reduces our pop consumer goods upkeep by 10%. Now, a 10% reduction in upkeep is much worse than a 10% bonus to something like production, just because of the way the numbers will work. We can usually increase the base value of our production and then get a bonus stacked on top of that, but in this case, it is a reduction to consumer goods upkeep. It's not F tier, and the reason for that is that it only costs one trait point, and that reducing your pop consumer goods upkeep can be useful. But the overall impact of this trait is going to be quite minimal. A notable exception for that though is the biotrophies in a machine empire. It can be quite reasonable to reduce their upkeep using this trait. Nomadic increases the pop growth from immigration by 15% and reduces the resettlement cost by 25%. Now the first part of this isn't actually that useful and in the later game it can be quite a challenge to get immigration growth happening across your planets without causing unemployment and unhappiness on those planets. So that part of it is a bit more micro and not that useful. The bottom part here though, resettlement cost minus 25%, that's definitely useful and worthwhile if you're doing a bit of micro to move your pops around. But again, if you're not doing that, not so useful. It's only one point though, and that's why it deserves its position here in C. It does, however, get better as the game goes on, as we get more colonies, more planets, and have more pops to move around. Quick Learners increases your leader experience gain by plus 25%. This is not that helpful. Yes, you're going to get there much faster with your first level, a bit faster with your second level, but then by future levels, it's, uh, it's not really that much of a big deal. And honestly, I don't think it's worth a whole trait point for this. It's going to get worse as the game goes on and your leaders get to higher levels. The effective increase or effective decrease in time it takes between levels is going to be uh, less and less, but, but it can be quite a nice trait from a roleplay perspective. Very strong is quite an expensive trait. It does cost us three points. In return for that, we get army damage plus 40% and worker pop resource output plus 5%. The first part with army damage is pretty mediocre, but that second part, the worker pop resource output plus 5%, is pretty nice. However, if you're running any sort of normal build, you're probably not going to have very many farmers, so this is effectively a plus 5% to miners and a plus 5% to technicians, which is all right, but at the cost of three trait points, I would definitely say it deserves its place here in C. Phototrophic replaces half of the food upkeep with energy. Now this is the cheaper version of Radiotrophic, and for the same reasons that was a bit rubbish, this is a bit rubbish as well. Though it is half the price, and you're not paying extra for those extra bonuses you generally won't use, and therefore I bumped it up to C. What do you think about this tier list so far, and what do you think about it at the end? Please let me know in the comments section. I'm sure some of you are going to absolutely disagree with my ordering, though of course a lot of this is down to personal preference. We do all play this game in slightly different ways, but I would love to hear from you. Again, I intend to answer as many comments as I possibly can in the first few hours of release of this video, so please let me know if you have something to tell me. All right, now we're getting to the B tier. We've definitely got some good stuff in here, though it's not quite at the quality of the S tier or the A tier. Some of it is still definitely worthwhile, and it really does depend on the build your empire is running. Extremely adaptive at the cost of a whopping four trade points gives us plus 20% habitability on all worlds. Why is this here? Why is this the first trait in the B tier? Well, habitability is a great bonus. What it does is it increases our pop growth speed, it increases our resource output, it decreases the upkeep of our pops, as well as reducing their amenities usage. So a plus 20% bonus to habitability at the start of the game means you are getting plus 10% pop growth speed and plus 10% job output, along with minus 20% to your upkeep and minus 20% to your amenities usage on all of your colonies. However, as the game goes on, this bonus, it becomes worse and worse because on those first colonies, you'll go from 80 to 100% habitability, which is the maximum. And then as you research more technologies, as new traditions become available, you're going to be boosting the base habitability of all pops in your empire. So 
this really becomes uh, quite useless from the point of view of a long-term game as you'll get to that 100% without needing it anyway. And for that reason, at its high cost, it sits here in B. Communal reduces the pop housing usage of your pops by 10%. This means for every 10 pops, you'll now only need nine housing. But why is this useful? Why does it deserve a place in the B tier? Well, now your logistic pop growth is governed by the carrying capacity of your planet, which is a function of your available housing plus unused tiles, unused district slots. That means that communal could increase your logistic pop growth earlier and better and faster and maintain that high level of logistic pop growth later on and much later than you would normally get with an equivalent level of population. For that reason, it's ended up here in the B tier. Enduring increases your leader lifespan by 20 years at the cost of only one trait point. It has all of the issues of venerable, though with a lower cost, and that's why it has a place here in B. Industrious increases your mineral output from jobs by 15%. This costs two trait points, so it is a little expensive, although it is one of the two main jobs you're going to have in your empire from a point of view of your workers producing resources. For that reason, it does sit comfortably here in the B tier, although minerals and actually producing minerals via population is not the best way of getting minerals. It's not the most efficient resource from a pop management perspective. Natural sociologists increases your society research from job output by 15% at the cost of only one trait point. This is pretty good, although I would argue that society research is the worst of the three research branches. You have the worst options in there available to your empire, and for that reason it's going to sit here in B. Strong is a slightly cheaper version of very strong at a lower benefit. So this increases army damage by 20% and worker pop resource output by 2.5% at only the cost of one trait point. This, again, will only really be effective for your minor jobs or technician jobs, and it only increases it by 2.5%. Not that much, but it does only cost one point, so that's why I've placed it here. Traditional increases your unity output from jobs by 10% at the cost of only one trait point. But why is it all the way down here in the B tier? Why isn't it higher up? Well, unity at the moment before the 3.3 unity rework isn't the most fantastic resource available. And a lot of the best unity builds don't actually produce unity from jobs. So for that reason, it's not actually an exceptional trait. Nerve Stapled is the first of the biological ascension traits that you unlock in the game by following the biological ascension path that we're going to be looking at. What does it do? Well, it increases the resources from all jobs by 5%, although that pop can no longer be employed in any ruler, specialist, or complex drone jobs. They cannot generate leaders. They can't join a faction. But on the plus side, they're not affected by happiness which can be a very useful bonus for slave pops. It does cost three trait points, so in some ways it's very similar to the very strong, although I bumped it up a level as it now means you can completely eliminate the unhappiness problems of your slave pops with no issues and a little bit of genetic tampering. Welcome to the A tier. We're not quite at the elite of the elite yet, but now we've got some very good, very spicy traits at our disposal. Adaptive increases your habitability by 10%. It's the first member of the A tier. Why is it not in the B tier like extremely adaptive? Well, it's going to take a lot longer before this becomes useless to your empire. The plus 10% habitability for only two trait points is quite useful on all of your other colonies as you're going to get 5% extra pop growth and 5% extra resource output as well as 10% less upkeep, etc. But it's going to be a viable option for longer, though it does get worse as the game progresses. Ingenious increases your pop energy credits from jobs by plus 15%. It is quite expensive at two points, but energy is the base resource in the game and the most important basic resource. And for that reason, a plus 15% here is the best of the, of the three traits that increase your basic resource production, that being ingenious, industrious, and agrarian. However, there are still traits which are better than ingenious, and that's why it's sat down here in the A tier. 
natural physicist boosts our physics research from jobs by plus 15%. In my opinion, physics is the middle of the three research branches in terms of how good it is for your empire. And for that reason, natural physicists is a little bit higher than natural sociologists. Serviles is a very interesting trait. It gives us plus 10% happiness and plus 10% resources from jobs output. That's really good. However, any pop with serviles cannot become a governor or scientist and they cannot be employed in ruler or specialist jobs. This does only cost a single trait point, but there is a hidden cost here, and that is you have to pick the syncretic evolution origin. This means that from an overall perspective, it might not be that great, but from simply a trait perspective, at the cost of only a single point, it is absolutely fantastic. Next we have Robust, which is another trait you unlock by going down the biological ascension path. This gives us plus 30% habitability, plus 5% resources from jobs, and plus 50 years to our leader lifespan. It does cost us a whopping four trait points, but it's very important to note that by the time you complete the biological ascension path, you won't really be limited by trait points, but instead you'll be limited by the fact you can only pick five different traits. For that reason, it does sit up here, right up in the A tier, though it's not the S tier, and its cost is very high. That extra resource output from jobs and habitability isn't something to sniff at. Delicious is a very strange trait. It means that you get plus two food output from all livestock and processing pops. This is a brilliant trait to put on a slave or subservient species, which you have as livestock later on in the game. You will need biological ascension to unlock it, but it's very, very useful and definitely quite a bit of fun. The last trait in the A tier is aquatic. Now, this was originally something that would have not been in the list as it was meant to be a zero point trait, but they increased it to one in the pre-release patch. Fair enough. What does it do? Well, we get plus 20% habitability on ocean worlds, reduced housing usage on ocean worlds, and workers get plus 10% output on all of those ocean worlds. At only a single point, it is a fantastic trait if you can get your hands on enough ocean worlds. And from that point of view, I really have to say I recommend it, especially for hive mind empires. We've seen the rest, now let's look at the best. Welcome to the S tier. What do we have in this S tier? Well, the first thing we've got is charismatic. Amenities output from jobs plus 20%. As a trait for only two points, this is fantastic. This can almost eliminate our need for entertainer type jobs across any regular biological empire. And for a hive mind, it's going to massively reduce the number of drones we need in the maintenance drone role. Intelligent gives us a plus 10% research output from jobs across all three of the research branches. Yes, it costs two trade points, but in Stellaris, technology and getting more technology is one of the most important things in this game. And for that reason, Intelligent comfortably sits in pretty much one of the most common auto includes for any biological empire. Complementing Intelligent quite nicely is Natural Engineers. That's going to increase your engineering research from jobs by plus 15%. When you combine it with Intelligent, that's plus 25% for what I would say is arguably the best research tree in Stellaris, and that is engineering research. It's also important to note that this trait is mutually exclusive with natural physicists and natural sociologists, and as it's the best of the three, it's the one I'd recommend you pick. Rapid breeders at the cost of two points increases our pop growth speed by 10%. This one is very fantastic, though I think some people like it a little bit less since the pop growth rework in 3.0. I, however, still think it's fantastic. It's actually even better as the game goes on, because this 10% bonus growth speed becomes more and more important as the total growth points we need to accumulate in order to grow a new pop increases due to the increasing number of pops in our empire. This difference, this 10%, becomes a larger time saving the more pops we have in our empire. And as pops are the most important resource in Stellaris, increasing them is a no-brainer. 
For a long time, Thrifty and Trade Value was regarded as being completely trash in Stellaris. No longer are those days with us. Now, Thrifty is sitting comfortably in the S tier. What does it do? It increases Trade Value from jobs by 25%. Now, it's important to note that this bonus is actually before any other technology is applied to our trade value. This increases the base output of our trade jobs by 25% before we stack any modifiers. For that reason, as the game continues, Thrifty provides a bigger and bigger bonus to our trade value output and thus gets better the longer we play. And as merchant meta is so prevalent at the moment, Thrifty deserves its place up here in the S tier. Budding is a very interesting trait. For each pop on a planet, that pop now produces 0.02 monthly organic pop assembly, which doesn't sound like very much but you only need to have 23 population on a planet and you will be getting more pop growth than if you had rapid breeders on that planet. That means that as the game goes on, budding becomes a much better version of rapid breeders. And as we're about to see in a minute, it is fantastic to use in combination with another trait. And on top of that, it also stacks with clone vats and the spawning pools, making it even better. Erudite increases our research output by 20%, making it twice as good as intelligent, increases our leader level cap by one, and gives our leaders some special traits. Now, this is up here because it is twice as good as intelligent at only double the cost, as well as the traits which make it really very good. It is a no-brainer, if you'll pardon the pun, to choose Erudite for your pops in addition to something like Natural Engineers. Fertile increases your pop growth speed by 30%, yes, you heard me correctly, a whopping 30%, and reduces your pop housing usage by 10%, just like communal. So it has all the benefits of communal, whilst having three times the benefits of rapid breeders. Yes, if you take this, you cannot take rapid breeders, but you can take budding as well. Fertile plus budding together is an insanely powerful combination for maximum biological pop growth if you've gone down the biological ascension path. Well, we've seen what is great to take from a positive perspective, but what about the negative traits? Which traits are going to impact our species the least if we take them? Now, I'm mainly going to focus on the F tier and the S tier, because that's really all you need to get the maximum benefit of your points. So let's look at that. Down in the F tier, we have non-adaptive, which reduces your habitability by 10%. That is an effectively a 5% reduction to your resource output and a 5% reduction to your pop growth. Unless you've taken Void Dwellers for your start or something like that, do not take this trait. It is very, very annoying to have, and it is a massive reduction. Yes, it will get better over time as you research new technologies and unlock new traditions to improve your habitability, but it's really not that great. Repugnant reduces the amenities from jobs by 20%. This is the inverse of charismatic and it can be absolutely crippling because you're going to need not just some entertainers, you're going to need a lot of entertainers, a lot of amenities producing pops on your worlds. If you are a hive mind, you're going to need so many more maintenance drones don't take it. The two points might be great to spend on something else, but there are no positives that can outweigh this negative. Slow breeders at the cost of getting two trait points refunded gives you minus 10% to your pop growth speed. There's no universe in which this can be worth it unless you found some magical way of just getting pops to explode out of holes in the ground like dwarves. I, I really can't see how it's going to be useful. Don't pick it. C and B tier have a variety of traits, but generally speaking, you're only going to be picking a maximum of two negative traits, and you'll probably only need three points getting refunded, so you probably don't want to pick these B and C traits, as there are better traits, or should I say, somewhat paradoxically, better worse traits available, so you don't really want to pick these. In the A tier for negative trait choices, we have solitary, that gives us a plus 10% to pop housing usage, and sedentary, which reduces pop growth from immigration by 15%, and resettlement costs is increased by 25%. Now, 
Both of these are not massive problems for your empire. The resettlement cost can be a little annoying, but if you're not running a build where you need to do much resettling, for instance, if you're running egalitarian and you literally cannot resettle your pops, sedentary becomes less of an issue. Though, of course, these are only one point each, so you probably want to maximize the number of points you are regaining by choosing at least one of the negative traits with two points and that'll bring me on quite nicely to the S tier. These traits, I would say, are pretty much instant picks for your empire in order to maximize the number of trait points at your disposal at the start of the game. By picking these two traits in combination, you're going to be getting an extra three trait points, meaning you have five points to play with at the start of the game, so you can get two expensive two-point traits and a nice cheap one-pointer. Deviance reduces governing ethics attraction by 15% and refunds a single point. But basically, as I've talked about before, this governing ethics attraction is not really going to have much effect overall on your empire, on your ability to actually govern, and on your ability to play the game. So it's pretty much a free point. Unruly increases our empire sprawl from pops by 10%. At the start of the game, that's going to have no effect on our empire. As the game goes on, it's going to continue to have no effect on our empire. A little bit later into the game, it will start to have a small effect, increasing the empire sprawl from pops by 10%. And into the deep late game, if we've got thousands of pops in the late game, yes, it can start being a minor inconvenience. But as of patch 3.2, we can simply make some more bureaucrat jobs and we've done away with this penalty entirely. Or we can let it run a bit and in the early game that's going to be a few extra percent slowing down our research speed. Oh no, but that extra two trade points is phenomenally juicy. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to see what these traits will allow you as a species to work towards, the culmination of an entire evolutionary history, that is, mega structures, click the video on screen now.